I was thinking perhaps now's the time for just uh, the beginnings of some of the historical context on all of this. You have to understand that this isn't happening because of uh, some series of just incredible coincidences, uh, mm -hmm. accidents, oversights. You have to understand that this is actually orchestrated. It's, it's part of a program that that's a, a bit older than most of the people who are watching this right now. If you want to take a look back to its more immediate roots, then you're going to take a look back to the 20th century, most of it. And what you're going to take a look at is uh, eugenics, and uh, you're going to take a look at some lectures that were done. And these were done over in London. These are done to the uh, Royal Society, or the yeah, the Royal Society. Of London. Of London. <clears throat> um, the man's name's escaping me. I'm getting blanked right now. What man's name? Who wrote the uh, articles, who did the lectures. Busby? No, Bertrand Russell. Oh, Bertrand Excuse Russell. Me. Bertrand Russell, ladies and gentlemen, is who you'll want to look up. And what you're looking for are his lectures. They were published in 1954. For. And um, the impact of science on society. That's the one. Yeah. A lovely volume. We do have it posted mm -hmm. on the website. Mm -hmm. You will want to take a look at this because what it is is it is the outline that explains how all of these incredible events are sewn together and what it is that their intended outcome is for it. Now, the law of unintended consequences comes in and it's just going to hammer these people because they really haven't thought this through. They're kind of, even for long-term thinkers, and they are very long-term thinkers, they, they're a little short-sighted. There are, are certain things about the spirit and about mankind that they kind of overlooked. And their misunderstanding of what the human genome actually is is just staggering. And so they have a program of eugenics and all of these things up to and including these neutron pulse machines with fuses of various lengths, which are presently running. These are your nuclear power stations throughout the world. And um, there are countries that are still considered to be developing. It's a, a cycle of boom and bust. And right now the boom is happening in China and the guarded boom. The enlightened boom is happening over in Russia, and we'll see whether or not they're able to protect themselves. But as far as the overview to why these events are happening, why planes are being compromised, why Fukushima is just the tip of an iceberg that is much, much more dangerous, and yet is in the process of creating an entropic environment such that you have to come out of the gate. I mean, at birth, you have to start defending yourself from this. And your mother had better be defending you from it while you're being created. What they're trying to do is they're trying to do away with any kind of free-range procreation. They're trying to bring it inside of their laboratories. And at the rate that they're going, they may succeed, though I doubt it. We'll see. But we can get back to the actual immediate impacts now. It was just a question of putting some of this in context. So I think what we wanted to talk about were the indicators that were correlates to these studies, and these indicators are occurring in glass. Now, unlike metal, which is a crystal, the underlying fundamental structural difference is glass is not. Glass is a liquid, and Loren can tell you all about this. No? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, glass does not have a crystalline structure. Uh, the composition is SiO2, silicon with two oxygens attached to it. That's a molecule uh, that is in glass unless there are other things added to it, trace traces of other elements. Um, so glass is a supercooled liquid. If it had a crystalline structure, <clears throat> it would be harder to um, 
to use in the ways they use it for lenses, for windows, for all kinds of things. And a uh, super cooled liquid means that they melted it. Uh, basically, uh, SiO2 in nature as a crystal is quartz. And so what they've done is they've taken a whole lot of quartz sand, melted it, and poured it into different forms or rolled it out or whatever they do to it to make whatever they want to produce. And um, because it doesn't have a crystalline structure, it's below its melting point in our normal environment. And so it quenches into a super cooled liquid that seems like it's a solid, but it's not. It's just below its freezing point, basically. And um, it's used uh, in um, treating as a technology to, um, to store nuclear waste. And so they will melt it, silicon dioxide, they will liquefy it, add the radioactive nuclides, the nuclear waste to it, mix it all up, and then they pour it in big drums. And in Europe, uh, especially the British, I think the French have also done that, they're throwing it overboard into the ocean, the drums of glass uh, or vitrified, vit the vitri vitrification process. But over time, it decomposes from the, uh, the, the energy released uh, by the uh, radioactive materials from the nucleus. And... Um, what else did you want to talk about? Did you did you have more questions, Christina? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I was muted. I'm looking through my notes here for um, for all the glass examples I have. The damage but, from and there's there's just so many. I don't even yes. know like where to start. But we we had a number of incidents that occurred from the Kadena Air Force Base in Japan. That's right. This is right in the <clears throat> beginning when we started collecting uh, articles and news uh, stories about problems with airplanes. And one of the earliest ones, I believe you sent it to me, was uh, problems with, with older fighter jets that were used for training at the Kadena military base in Japan, in, in Okinawa, and I've actually been there. I've stood up above the runway and watched uh, CIA rendition jets taking off with no markings on them, headed straight for Asia, probably Afghanistan. And um, what, what caught my attention is the fact that uh, Okinawa is quite to the south. Uh, down by Taiwan from uh, Japan, but it is a part of Japan, and there are, I believe, uh, 14 military bases. There are a lot of military bases, and 25% of the land is in U.S. military bases. So the story came out that um, a jet, a fighter jet, a pilot was being trained in it, uh, landed without the windshield and uh, then the story mentioned that 10 uh, fighter jets had already had pieces flying off the airplane in flight and uh, and it turned out that there were actually four more fighter jets that had lost their windshields in flight <clears throat> so these pilots have contained air and they have helmets and so forth and so on um, they had to land their jets uh, without any windshields on them and it's actually the frame which is made out of thin metal that the glass is uh, held uh, or attached to the the cockpit with and that's where the problem was and that's the Wigner effect it attacks uh, thin metal uh, much faster than, um, than 
uh, thicker metal or stronger parts. And so where the fuselage is, where you have thin metal, where um, uh, the um, crimp, the hoses, uh, the rubber hoses, like in the landing gear, hydraulics, are crimped on with thin pieces of metal onto the heavier metal fitting, uh, which um, carries the fluids through the pipes, metal pipes. Uh, it's those places that are very susceptible to Wigner damage. And that's why there's so many problems with landing gear. Um, at the same time that happened in Kadena, there was a fighter jet uh, reported in Russia that could not get the front landing gear down in time to land. But he did have rear landing gear, which was down. So he had to land on the rear landing gear and <laughs> sort of fly down the runway on those rear rear wheels uh, until the speed of the plane uh, lowered to uh, a, a point where the um, airlift did not support, hold the plane up anymore. And so it skidded down the rest of the runway on the belly. And I'm seeing more and more of this, uh, the, the most <coughs> of the problems are in the Pacific region. Hawaii is getting planes landing all the time, every day almost. Uh, emergency landings, Guam, other Pacific islands. But of course, because Fukushima is releasing huge amounts of radiation every single day for every day since it's happened, um, the air column of the Pacific is more contaminated than any other area of, of the world. And the highest incident rate of forced landings or emergency landings, crashes and everything is in the United States. And that's because the radiation is coming this way from Japan. Um, and the uh, American... Um, government has created such an economic disaster in the United States and Fukushima's had an effect too that our airplanes, our commercial planes are not being serviced properly, they're not being maintained, they uh, are stealing, the companies are stealing the pension funds of the employees, then selling the company to another uh, airline company, they're merging, and each time those mergers occur, um, the pension funds are stolen from yet another company of employees. Yeah. With that corporate name change comes a hand washing. Yes. <clears throat> I, I want to remind everyone, too, who is not familiar with the releases from the Fukushima accident that there were 2,000 isotopes, as Loren had mentioned earlier, that blew out of those reactors, out of that site, and are continuing to this day. There was an EU study that concluded Fukushima had released 210 quadrillion becquerels of just cesium-137 into the air at the beginning of the accident and a senior researcher at JMA, Marine Chemistry, had said that 30 billion becquerels of cesium and 30 billion becquerels of strontium are being released into the ocean every day. Yes. And from what we know just about cesium chemistry, cesium reacts rapidly with water. It actually becomes exothermic. And when it combines, it forms cesium hydroxide. Cesium hydroxide has a very strong base, and it rapidly etches the surface of not only semiconductors like silicone, but it's very corrosive to glass. And we have historic evidence of this happening during weapons testing. There was an article that appeared in the St. Petersburg Times 
on April 17th of 1954, following the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb, which was detonated on March 1st of 1954 at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. It was the most powerful nuclear device ever detonated by the United States. It was about one-third the energy of the Tsar Bomba, and it had a yield of 15 megatons of TNT. And in the days following, in the weeks following, there were pockmarked windshields that became an international incident because of this nuclear test. And I'll read this directly from the article. Reports of pitted or pockmarked automobile windshields spread south to Olympia, the capital of Washington, and north across the Canadian border to Victoria, British Columbia today. At the same time, the menace appeared to be growing throughout northwest Washington as reports of damaged windshields swamped police switchboards. They had car dealerships that were calling in. People who had their cars parked outside and on the streets. Um, schools. Malls. Everywhere that there were cars parked, they were having these pockmarked windshields. Um, the police cruisers were noticing the same thing. It said in this article, investigations into the mysterious phenomenon thus far have not produced an answer to what is causing the windshield suddenly to show up with pits of varying size. Theories range all the way from simply defective glass to harmful industrial ash and to fallout of dust from H-bomb tests in the Pacific. In London, they had had a similar outbreak of these pitted windshields over a two-year period and investigations from an investigation from the authorities showed what they thought was mass hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> well, they reported as mass hysteria. And you're right, Christine, I've seen the article that you're talking about, and I was looking back through what are called the morgue files at uh, newspapers.com, and I found many other examples of that one which also reminded me about uh, the car trips we used to go on. I grew up in the 50s, and we used to go out on car trips. And one of the things that I would see in the countryside of Pennsylvania, for instance, and Ohio, that variety of thing, were the roadside signs to come in and see the two-headed cow or the mm -hmm. two-headed chicken or the this or the that. The number of co-joined births that were immortalized in roadside uh, signs in America in the 50s mm -hmm. and the early 60s are staggering. And what I've been doing since Fukushima happened is collecting every story that I can find in the media all over the world that indicates another conjoined twin was born and this is not just humans it it's in animals too and i've been plotting those on maps and um the um conjoined twinning has always been very very rare until those are the siamese twins that, that they would put in traveling circuses and so forth and uh basically Pre-1900, pre-actually 1898, is the, um, the pre-human uh, man-made uh, radiation period. And uh, there is radiation that exists in the environment from minerals in rocks that uh, through sedimentation processes that breaks down they get into rivers and loft it into the air and people it gets into people's bodies and causes birth defects but very 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 rarely and um, when they started bomb testing they polluted the whole entire planet including lower orbital space with man-made radiation and so the health effects globally have been horrendous but they've been much higher in the United States because the U.S. government detonated over 1,200 
nuclear bomb test at the Nevada test site. And that radiation uh, contaminated every person in the United States. And there are many families with um, multi-generational now uh, health effects, birth defects, and so on uh, as a consequence of the bomb test. So when they're talking about bomb tests and nuclear technologies, they're talking about how much the technology costs to build, to mine the radiation, and blah, blah, blah. But no one ever talks about the human cost. And that is much higher than any other dollar and cents amount which is normally talked about. When they analyzed at the Seattle Police Laboratory this material that was found on the pitted windshields, the chief of police said that the particles were something like the drippings from the end of a soldering iron. So, I mean, if this was doing this to glass, you know, what was it doing to people? What was it doing in the food supply? And, you know, when, whenever you and I have done interviews, whether we're talking about the health effects, excess mortality rates, sickness and cancer, heart attacks and athletes and young people and people that travel a lot, people that fly a lot or, or live on the West Coast, something that always comes up in each interview is you always say, none of this is new. That's right. That's right. All right, should we move on to number three? Yes. Electrical components, Larry? Well, it's, it's all part and parcel of the same effects. The effects that you described, the effects, the multiplier effect that tra traveling electricity has in gathering other, uh, attracting other uh, forms of radionuclide. And what happens is they're hitting each other, bouncing off of each other. They're pulling energy off of each other and out of the metal and the medium that they're transiting through, that variety of thing. You have to put up more shielding. There's more that you have to do to protect your electronics as you go down the road because the electronics themselves are getting thinner. Uh, the, the, the equation just, it, it all marches in the same direction and it's in, inevitable, it's zero sum. And nanotechnology is a really good example of uh, the electrical effects of radiation. You cannot do nanotechnology in the presence of radiation. It destroys the process, it destroys the technology. Because nanotechnology is controlled by projected electrical fields that help the atoms assemble themselves. Uh, the atoms are like building blocks. And so um, this would be kind of like a, a Lego set or, or something like that. And um, so you take the pieces, the atoms are the pieces, you you project an electrical field and manipulate it and manipulate the atoms into uh, forming whatever molecule or compound you want. Uh, nanoparticles are very, very small. They are a tenth of a micron or smaller in diameter. And it is these nano-sized particles of radiation that are spewing out of Fukushima, out of nuclear power plants, out of uh, nuclear waste storage facilities like WIP and uh, in, in New Mexico and the Yucca Mountain Project in Nevada. And there isn't any country, uh, there isn't any technology that exists that can store safely store and immobilize radiation. So why do they continue? Oh. Where'd we get cut off? Nanoparticles. Nanoparticles. Did you hear anything I said about them? Yeah. Where did it get cut off? Uh, let me check here. See if I can open my recorder. 
Hmm. I'll just Better start if we just do it from memory. Yeah, I'll just start with the nanoparticles. Okay. Um, nanoparticles are a good example of uh, the. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nanotechnology is a very good example of how electricity or electrical fields or electrical technologies are affected by ionizing radiation, which is what we're talking about. And nano uh, technology occurs in projected fields of electricity to um, the building blocks of material, of matter, and those would be atoms. And they project a, uh, an electrical field and they manipulate the atoms in that electrical field to uh, form building blocks that produce very, very tiny particles, a tenth of a micron in diameter or smaller. Now, a human hair is 50 to 80 microns in diameter, if you cut it in half. A tenth of a micron is many times smaller than that. And uh, this is basically what is being released from these nuclear power plants from nuclear weapons. And by the way, they're using many nukes on the battlefield uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Gaza, all over the world. And uh, they are exempt from international treaties if they're five kilotons or smaller. Now, I was trained by a uh, Manhattan Project scientist, Marion Falk, who made the hydrogen bomb work for the United States government by solving all the problems on it. And uh, he taught me uh, for 10 years in his living room all of this information, how to think about it, how to present it, because he said, I'm opposed to exposing the public to radiation, ionizing radiation, and I want you to be my spokesperson and go around the world and warn people because I can't do it. Uh, there are many countries he could not even go to if they even let him out of the United States, and he's in his 90s now. So I did that. And um, the, uh, the problem with nanoparticles is they are not subject to the gravitational forces, so they stay suspended in the air permanently until they're rained out or snowed out. And um, the problem with Fukushima and other nuclear technologies that release radiation, this is on the battlefield or for energy or for whatever they're using it for, is that once they get into the atmosphere, 95% uh, are rained or snowed out into the environment in uh, just three months. And with the nuclear bomb tests that injected the radiation high into the atmosphere, 85% of it is still up there. Only 15% of the radiation made it down into our environment. And look at the effects of just 15% to human health and well-being in the United States. We have the highest rate of mental illness in the world. The Journal of the American Medical Association published a UN report on brain damage on mental illness around the world by country. And over 26% of the American population has some form of mental illness. Nigeria is less than 4% because they were not subjected to bomb test material like Americans were. And um, so this is the effect of Fukushima, which is thousands and thousands and thousands of times more radiation than Chernobyl re released. This is the greatest and most horrific military weapon that's ever been used in the history of the world. This is a fact, and it's a triple weapon. It works three different ways right now, and it's working very efficiently. You have got 
your fission fusion process is going on uh, down with the uh, plutonium and the uranium. Those are creating nanospheres, what was being yes. described a moment ago. They are creating the Bremsstrahlung and actively creating Wigner dust in an accelerated fashion out of Fukushima. The plant, the town, the rocks, the trees, all of it, and it is actively neutron pulsing. Triple weapon. And Triple it's weapon. very effective. How do you turn this one off? You can't. Loren, can you explain a little bit more about what Wigner dust is? Yes. For people who maybe don't understand the concept, and then also, how does that um, how does that synergize with other contamination issues that we have in our environment in terms of health? Like you had mentioned, the mental illness, and we know also that we've had you know fluoride that's been added to our our drinking water for years and other right. you know toxic areas in our environment and you and I have also followed stories closely um, like the Malibu high school situation right. where they had toxic building materials and this was a school in a high risk area that's on the west coast that had been hit with fallout where a number of teachers and students were, were getting sick and I think there were like six people from just that one school right that developed thyroid cancer and now you know birth defects happening around Hanford at an exponential rate how is this all synergizing and where does this Wigner or Wigner dust fit into all this um, when there is a nuclear event that reaches high temperatures those high temperatures are energy that breaks the molecular bonds of matter or materials that are involved in that uh, event. Those produce nanoparticles if the temperatures are high enough and in the case of depleted uranium used in bombs and missiles, warheads, bullets, uh, every munition now practically has uh, a an option to use depleted uranium in it. and. They, uh, when they catch on fire, uranium is pyrophoric. In other words, it's a metal that burns. It burns at 5,000 degrees centigrade, which is hotter than the sun. And so it breaks these molecules um, into smaller and smaller parts. And what uh, depleted uranium does is it actually creates a radioactive poison gas and that's actually what is coming out of Fukushima a radioactive poison gas and it's from the nuclear reactor explosions it's from the explosions now underground from the elephant foot or the fissioning uh, melted fuel that's burning down into the uh, geologic environment and it is getting into the ocean and um, it they just travel everywhere uh, they're in water they're in air everything is every living thing is inhaling them or ingesting them and or ingesting them our drinking water is all contaminated and um, a nanoparticle has three effects. Number one is a chemical effect. So a chemical effect is, is from the electrons in the outer shore cell, um, sorry, shell of the, uh, the uh, atom. And uh, that would be like iron or um, iodine or calcium they all have a chemical effect um, the next effect is the radioactive effect and that is the energy ejected from the nucleus now all elements are formed in star processes with um, energy regimes temperatures and pressures that are unknown on the planet earth 
And when these atoms are formed, for instance, plutonium and uranium form in supernovas. And so um, it takes the extreme temperature and energy regimes in those star processes to form these more and more complex atoms. And in the case of uranium and plutonium, when they eject an alpha particle, for instance, uranium-235 uh, ejects an alpha particle from the nucleus, the binding energy for the molecules in the human cells that make life possible in the cell, uh, it's less than 10 electron volts of energy. But that one alpha particle, which is going to travel a distance of about one cell, releases 4.2 million electron volts. So it's nuking or supernovaing, supernovaing a cell. And as that alpha particle travels along its path, it's releasing the loose change of energy with as gamma rays. So you see these little squiggly gamma rays that are released as the alpha particle moves through tissue. And they have their own energy. And um, some uh, elements release x-rays from the nucleus. Some release beta particles. It's all, all, all deadly to biological systems, whether it's an alpha particle, beta, gamma, or x-ray. They damage in different ways and it depends on the how much energy is released over how long a path. Um, but the alpha particle is the most deadly and it's because it travels a very short distance and releases a very concentrated amount of energy um, in a very uh, small distance and that energy proliferates out through uh, the whole neighborhood of cells around the cell that it probably kills. And all those cells become dysfunctional. This is what causes disease. And um, that's, so that's the radiation effect. But the deadliest effect is the non-specific enzyme or catalyst effect from the nanoparticle size itself. And these nanoparticles get into the lungs. 70% of what you inhale goes directly into the bloodstream and it gets into the lipids and or the cholesterol and it's carried into the most intimate parts of the cell and the body. Hidden. It's hidden in the lipids and hidden in the cholesterol so that the body's defenses cannot protect against it. And what happens in the cell is the cell is a network of pipes and plumbing and pumps and all kinds of, of uh, uh, different technologies that make life possible in that cell that bring the nutrients in and take the waste out and uh, provide energy for the body. And so when those radioactive particles come in, uh, each step in the cell is tr triggered, turned on and off, by a specific catalyst or enzyme the body produces just for that one step. Each step has to happen in a procedural manner. A distinct sequence. A distinct sequence. And these particles come in and they're like a bunch of kids running around in a room, turning light switches on and off and making noise and creating total chaos. And it screws up all the processes in the cell. Now, that's bad enough. That's radiation exposure. But what they've done now is they have introduced a tremendous multiplier effect. Uh, in other words, synergistic effects where the radiation interacts with chemicals, radiation, pathogens in the chemtrails, for instance. Uh, the chemtrails are a multiplier effect with the radiation. 
on top of that, you have genetically modified food and organisms, GMO, that are foreign to life on Earth, and they are poisonous, they are a toxin, and they're interacting with the chemtrails and with the radiation. And remember, all our food and water is contaminated now. And then you have other factors. For the last 20 years, iodine has been removed from the American diet by the government. And Americans are depleted by 80% in their bodies of what normal iodine levels should be there. So when Fukushima radioactive iodine spewing out of that, uh, that, that death machine uh, is coming into our environment, into our bodies, into our developing fetuses, into our unborn babies. It's absolutely screwing up the whole body even before that poor baby is born. It's causing um, the, um, the endocrine system, which is the pituitary, the thyroid, and the adrenal gland, those three glands control and synchronize all of the organ function and everything in the body that makes life possible in a living human being. And um, so you're screwing that up. And with the Gulf War syndrome in our soldiers, that's a great example of what radiation does. Um, I have a list that was uh, from the Veterans Affairs, a presentation. Someone leaked the PowerPoint to Major Doug Rocky. He gave it to me. And there's a list of the Veterans Administration uh, diagnoses in 631,000 uh, Gulf-era soldiers who went to war in Iraq in 2003. And they had never been on a battlefield. They were policemen. They were National Guardsmen. They'd never been exposed to radiation and um, as soldiers. And the highest rate of illness diagnosed in those soldiers, and there were multiple diagnoses as well. They didn't just get sick from one thing. It was a whole web of diseases, and it was different in every person, and it changed over time. Neuromuscular diseases, neuromuscular problems, that's from damage to the mitochondria that are uh, produce all of the energy for the body, the ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, there were uh, mental problems was also, were also very high. There were uh, poisoning, skin rashes, just... Uh, 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 let's see, um, digestive system problems, metabolism problems. And in some soldiers, they were losing weight faster than if you starve them. It's because their body could not manufacture glucose because the metabolism of what they were eating was interrupted. And so the body had to take the nutrients it needed to produce glucose so the soldiers could could move or could live, the fun body function could continue, and they had to take it out of the human muscle of that person. So they lost weight faster than if they were starving to death because they were digesting their own bodies. Um, the least common diagnosis was cancer. And that is the reason cancer and birth defects are also always mentioned as, the, as being caused by uh, radiation exposure. It's because they're the least common diseases that are caused. Now, what they've done is to introduce all these other toxins. And by the way, they're releasing, releasing even more radiation uh, from the WIP um, uh, mm. nuclear waste facility. They're doing deliberate releases and from Yucca Mountain and from nuclear power plants and um, many, many, many ways. I mean, even phosphate fertilizers that they're spraying on fields have uranium in them. So anyone who's smoking, anyone who's using tobacco products, 
anyone who's using um, phosphate fertilizers or consuming food that that have been uh, um, they used um, phosphate fertilizers in the production of that food they're all getting more radiation that way um, it's it's really horrific even uh, even the the dairy producers are angry because protein milk powders being imported from Belarus contaminated with Chernobyl radiation and so cheese makers are importing this very very cheap source of contaminated milk powder that they're making their cheddar cheese out of instead of using American dairy products and this is before Fukushima happened and all this radioactive uh, milk powder today is going into junk food it's in spam it's in the artificial uh, dairy products that you put in um, coffee uh, it's hidden in so many ways so you see it can't be accidental we have food and radiation standards other countries do too and yet our food is loaded in hidden ways with radiation so they've poisoned the food they've poisoned um, the air they've poisoned the drinking water uh, the surface water is contaminated with rain out of Fukushima radiation and whatever local radiation you have released into the air and the groundwater they've done illegal fracking introducing horrific very dangerous chemicals into the pristine aquifers that are millions of years old that water is drinking like drinking champagne compared to the surface water which is like drinking beer and in some cases very dirty beer and the water municipalities are blending it so you can see um, how uh, how in hidden ways they're carrying out a global genocide and your health will be affected absolutely And your your birth history, your genetic what, predisposition yes, or weaknesses. Yes, yes. And what happens to the fetus, and when it happens in the uterus to that to that baby. Current diet and lifestyle are yes. also going to affect that, and your location. That's right. And how far you are from Fukushima is irrelevant. Uh, it's weather and geography determine how much radiation you will be exposed to. For instance, Pittsburgh and a city in Florida had higher radiation levels than anywhere else in the United States. And we actually have, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, fairly low radiation levels. Uh, it's 0.264 becquerels. Per second today, that's one fourth of a radioactive atom per second. One that, every four seconds. Yes, one every four seconds, and um, there's no way to escape it. Uh, I stayed indoors for a year after Fukushima happened. I live in Berkeley, California. I taped this to my printer right at eye level. I almost had a nervous breakdown for the first three months because I knew what was happening. Other people were not aware. Now they are understanding. And each Christmas, I go out and walk in the streets and ride on the public buses, public transportation, to see what the babies and the toddlers look like, to see how many birth defects are being expressed. And every year it increases. And even on the second year, the second Christmas after Fukushima, I got on a bus and there was a woman, an older African-American woman with a beautiful little blonde toddler. And I kept looking at the toddler. There was something strange about it. The feet looked like kind of like elephant feet. And she had a jacket on, but I couldn't see her hands or arms. And this uh, very nice woman was observing me and she said, this baby is a dwarf. 
and uh, I, I, I was just horrified. She was a year and a half old, and I said, when was she born? And she said, oh, she was born at the end of February in 2011. And I said, that was right before Fukushima. And I knew that she was, that the dwarfism is from damage to the endocrine system when that little child was a newborn. Well, speaking, speaking of fallout and weather patterns, I was looking at the list of airplane problems before we started this interview today. Yes. And I know from, from people who have been watching what the grad levels are across the country, that in the past week we've had significantly higher than what is like a post Fukushima normal. In certain areas of the country, the West Coast almost always, um, we've had a lot of rainfall in the Midwest. There's been some very high readings in Texas and also along the St. Lawrence Seaway, uh, Southern Quebec and uh, Northern New York, upstate New York. And when I look through the list of the corresponding days, that is where all of these plane incidents have occurred too. Oh. Interesting. That indicates when it's regional over a large area that it is environmentally caused. 